Scripture for our consideration this day comes from the Gospel of Mark in the Message Translation, printed within your bulletin as well. John the Baptizer appeared in the wild preaching a baptism of life change that leads to forgiveness of sins. People thronged to him from Judea and Jerusalem, and as they confessed their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River into a changed life. John wore a camel hair habit, tied at the waist with a leather belt. He ate locust and wild field honey. As he preached, he said, the real action comes next. The star in this drama to whom I'm a mere stagehand will change your life. I'm baptizing you here in the river, turning your old life in for a kingdom life. His baptism, a holy baptism by the Holy Spirit, will change you from the inside out. At this time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. The moment he came out of the water, he saw the sky split open and God's Spirit, looking like a dove, come down on him. Along with the spirit, a voice. You are my son, chosen and marked by my love, pride of my life. This is the word of God for you and me, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated as you are. Let us pray together. May your spirit, O God, stand between me and your people so that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together, be shaped, formed, and molded into the good news of the gospel of Christ, in whose name we've gathered, in whose name we pray, and in whose name we will depart and serve faithfully. And all of God's people did say, amen. Baptism is a theological thing that actually can create entire divides within denominations. I mean, after all, we teasingly talk about in the four Amarillo, how is it that Polk Street, the Methodist, beat the Baptist? And I always like to tease Howie Batson and say, you know, the Baptist beat the Methodist. We were the first church in Amarillo. And people will say, why? I said, simple. You see, the Baptist and the Methodist got here at the same time, but the Methodist could baptize with a cup of water. However, the Baptist dug a hole and waited for it to rain and fill up. So we got them by at least a year. There's such incredible differences in baptism. It it creates an unnecessary divide, and really it's something that's meant for our benefit. And what is its context? The context of baptism comes from what John was doing, which was a Jewish act of ritual cleansing. And people would go out to John in the wilderness as the prophet. They would come and they would confess their sins, and they would be baptizio, and that means to put under the water. That's what the Greek means. It doesn't mean to put the water above. This is sort of the joke in seminary that the Methodists put the water above, and the Baptists put the people below the water. But let me tell you sort of how simply we can kind of break this down. The people were coming, being baptized, and in fact they were baptizio, they were immersed in the water, But that wasn't the end of it. It was just the beginning. It was to prepare them for the coming Messiah. And as the scriptures unfold, John says, I am not the Messiah. I'm pointing to the Messiah. And in another gospel, you actually can read the words that John says, I'm not worthy to untie the sandals of Jesus. It's all about Jesus. So baptism points us in that direction. Uh, For us as United Methodists, we believe that baptism represents God's activity, God's hug, if you would, in our direction. I can't ever remember not being in the church. I mean, I was baptizing them, but they said I was screaming like crazy. I don't know. I don't remember it. Many of you may be in the same boat. Don't remember your baptism, but one of the most profound things for us to think about is you don't have to remember it. Because God hadn't forgotten it. It represents in the spirit biblically of 1 John that we love because God first loved us. I can baptize with water. I can baptize in running water like a river. And I learned one valuable lesson they did not teach at seminary. When in a river or running water of body of water, head upstream is a very important detail. (laughs) I've baptized in lakes. I've baptized in pools. 
because the water doesn't really matter. We can't go as crudely to Archie Bunker, if any of you remember who that is, half of you do, and the younger ones are going, I ain't got a clue who it is. But Archie Bunker spitting on his own grandchild and baptizing them. Remember that scene? We had to write a paper about that in seminary. I won't bore you with those details. Water is the symbol, it's the outward mark. The amount of water doesn't matter for us. It's what it represents what God's doing. It also means that when I am able to baptize everything from an eight-day-old to an 87-year-old and everything in between, where the person is does not matter. In other words, I can baptize someone who may be with Down syndrome, as I have in a previous church, who maybe wouldn't make a profession of faith like you or I would. Does that mean we withhold the sacrament of baptism for us in our tradition? No. We, we don't, because we take the waters, we baptize, and then we expect there to be a response, and that response is the profession of faith. In your Baptist church, it is a believer's baptism where you make the profession of faith, and then you're immersed. It's a powerful thing. It's not right or wrong, it's just different kinds of ways of doing it. Now, I'll jokingly tell you, as I've said often to my friend Howie, that whenever somebody joins the Baptist church from the Methodist church, they have to rebaptize them. But if you come to the Methodist church from the Baptist church, we just dry clean you. <laughs> we do water baptisms. In other words, we don't need to redo anything because what we represent, understand, is this is what God has done, not what you've done. It's God's work. So that's what we celebrate today. We celebrate that we renew this covenant that we have with God, that God's constantly said He is a God of love. He's reaching to us. He embraces us. But you know, you do more with your car registration sometimes than you do with your faith. Your driver's license has to be renewed, your credit cards have to be renewed, your registration has to be renewed. In a couple of months, all of you are gonna be getting that wonderful letter that says, here's your year in and how your house payment and dude and your escrow account is either needs more or is taking less from. My guess is it's gonna need a little more. <laughs> all those things get renewed, but when it comes to our faith, we just sort of go on autopilot. But it's important for us to remember we need to come to renew our yes to God. God's yes to us has never changed, but our yes to God can sometimes change. I have a colleague in another conference who, when preaching to a group of clergy, said two things. The first thing he said that I will never forget is, at third grade he was on the playground, and a friend came up to him and he said, Are you saved? And he said, I don't know. I'm a Methodist. <laughs> now, part of it is, in our United Methodist tradition, we have embraced, and lots of us come out of the, a, a clear memory of everything from the 40s, the 60s, 70s, 80s, that move, which means there's a, a social implication. In other words, if you say and profess with your mouth what you believe, it has to have an implication for your hands and what you do. And so we reach out in the world to make a difference in the world, to be engaged in the world in a social kind of way. But for many years, that became the only sort of measure. It didn't matter what you believed. It didn't matter what you thought. Folks, those things matter a lot. And so it's not an either or. It's a both and. It's both a sense of what are your core beliefs? What do you hang on to? But also, what do you do about it? And what if today the understanding of salvation could shift that you don't come, you don't quote, and by the way, you can't get saved, but you can receive salvation. It's a, it's a small word difference, but it's a big one. You can receive it because you see it's a gift. So you can receive salvation, what you do in response to it. And what if we understood we come to faith in God not to be saved from hell, but to be saved for a purpose in life. I like that image. The idea that the redemptive and sacrificial love of Christ was so that you and I might live up to something and not just have a faith insurance plan from a place where even Bermuda shorts won't make it comfortable. That's why I love the message translation. You are the pride of God's life. You are marked and chosen by God's love. How would that change our year if each of us lived into that idea that we are marked, we are chosen by God's love in Christ? I wonder if we might find a bit more soulful energy and fuel to press through the moments that are sort of intimidating and find courage to live faithfully whatever the challenge looks like. That's sort of the theological piece of it, but 
But I think it's important that we remember that when we talk about baptism, we're talking about all of us. You see, in the Methodist church, the way we understand things is there's a general ministry of the church. That's everybody who said yes. Okay? That's all of us. And even extending that graceful kind of thing, it's those who are saying maybe and hadn't said yes yet. I mean, it's all of us. That's the general ministry of the church. We're all involved in the general ministry of the church. And then some of us are in representative ministry as clergy. So 51 weeks of the year, and actually 52, I wear this robe and stole, and that's how I preach to you. It's kind of what you see me through. So I want to do something a little different today. I want to try to illustrate it to you this way. When you think about the robe and stole, that's not who I am. That's what I do. As your pastor. So today, let's just sort of put this on the shelf for a minute. We talk to you as Bert. Someone who's like you. I was raised in the church. I was a drug baby. Every day the doors of the church were open, I was drugged to church. <laughs> my sister says it best. She says that I can't ever remember not being a Christian or not being in church. And that's kind of my story. I don't have a sensational story about how far I drifted from God. Now look, my mother and sisters know some things that I did that are none of your business. Okay, that's, that, that's pre-call to ministry category. It's sort of classified information. But I went off and the first year that I... Um, that, that I really kind of thought about things. It was confirmation. I had to go through confirmation twice. I was in Plano First Methodist, and they did it in fifth grade, and then they did it in sixth grade when we got to Floral Heights Methodist Church in Wichita Falls, so I didn't fail it. I just had to repeat. And it gave me sort of, the, it sort of put the, the Lego pieces together for me, but it wasn't really until I was at an FCA retreat at Oklahoma State University when I heard Mike Singletary speak, and there was something of difference in my own faith and development between sixth grade and the end of my freshman year of high school, that the world looked different, and I really look in my own faith journey. If I were to write you a narrative of my biography, it was that, that summer when I heard Michael Singletary, middle linebacker, legendary from the Chicago Bears talk, that, that I would say that's really become sort of the normative kind of point from which I've continued to respond to God. Why do I say continue? Because as I have grown, I mean, when I, when I was down front with all that group renewing my commitment to Christ and Mike Singletary comes along, I mean, this mountain of a guy, he's a preacher kid. I mean, I know he was black and I was white, but we had a lot in common other than that. Uh, professional football player, ruddy kid, you know, a lot of differences, but he spoke to me. I thought, man, it can never get any more. There just can't be anything beyond this. I mean, this is just, this is it. This, this, is, this is what it's about. But then, then as I moved through high school, I mean, we were coming back after my junior year, and we were uh, coming back from a mission trip in Rajes, Mexico, and we all got together, and we got to lead a worship service, and it was a powerful renewal, and I felt that renewal of commitment, and I thought, man, this is it. This is, can't get any better than this. And I can track for you in my faith journey time and again where I thought, wow, it can't get any better than this. You see, it's been the same God luring and loving me the whole way, but as my life has changed, I've just simply renewed the contract on my side, renewed the covenant, renewed my yes to God. In that same speech my friend was giving, he said it this way when he closed, I hope that God is not done saving me yet. I love that imagery. I hope God's not done saving me yet. I know I'm really an unfinished piece of work. I mean, when I look at those formative pieces within my own journey and I look at my faith story, I don't have anything sensational. It's all capsulated in what happened at the Chaparral Baptist Assembly at my freshman year. I went to play high, uh, out of high school. I went to play a year of football at Austin College. No scholarship, so it's not really glorified. It was just this, this NIA division school down in Sherman, Texas. I followed some friends down there and went to the FCA retreat in the Chaparral Baptist Assembly and there were a group of guys from Baylor there. Any of you guys remember Cody Carlson and his crew? That was my generation of years. And there were like six or seven of them. And I look over, and here's the quarterback from Baylor. He's taller, stronger, and faster than I am. I'm a lineman. He's the quarterback. He could be a better center than I was where I was. And they, what they did is they said, okay, we want you a group of counselors who are here to work with the kids on this reeking retreat. We want each of you to uh, sort of mimic your, your mascot. So we're going to have a little charades game. See so if they can figure out where you're from. And so... 
here stood these five and six group of guys, just huge, bigger than me. And of course, the bear. I mean, that, that's, that, that's tough, isn't it? I mean, and the whole time I'm praying, oh, dear God, please let someone stop this before it gets to me. Dear God, please let someone stop this before it gets to me. And the reason I was praying that way is I was the only one from Austin College, and the mascot was a kangaroo. <laughs> that's, that's how I sort of compare in the sensational salvation stories, okay? And here's Bert. And then one of the guys ran up and go, hey, dude, where's your tail? <laughs> that's just really great. Thanks, man. I just don't have a sensational, you know, I was, you know, bailed out of jail or but I've always been surrounded by God's love. And I'm not so sure that that's even more difficult for some of us. Because you see, it's easy it is to always know that it's been part of our identity being the church. It's so easy, in the words of that song, to just slip sliding away. To just slowly slip slide away. And what used to be faithfulness becomes comfort. What used to be a sense of passion and call becomes convenience. And you look up one day, and, and, and you're so far away, and you wonder, how'd you get there? You just forgot to renew your yes. So today, I want to give you the opportunity to renew your yes to God. Here's how it practically works. Now, if we were to follow the liturgy of the United Methodist Church, uh, which we are in essence, but there's a thing called rubrics. Whenever you look in the, in the liturgy, you'll see little red words, the rubrics. The celebrant for remembering the baptism is to go to the baptismal font, and it's supposed to take the waters and say, Remember your baptism and be thankful. And so the Neely Royal has remembered its baptism. Huh? I mean, do you even feel it out there, Faith? No. Hey. I want you to touch the waters. I don't want you just to touch the waters. I want you to know that thanks to Ann Goforth, she brought her water from the River Jordan for me to use this morning. I've got three more bottles, so I can, I've got to get back to the Holy Land within three years. <laughs> Because what I do is I take this water, I run it through a coffee filter from the Jordan River, and then I put a couple of drops of Clorox in it to sanitize it. And then I add it to the Amarillo water that's here. So when you come in a moment, you'll be invited to come. You don't have to, but you'll be invited to come. You can touch the waters if you want. There are some small beads if you want to take one at the bottom to remember that you've said and renewed your yes to God today. Or many folks like to have the sign of the cross placed upon their head. We're happy to do that as well. But it's, it's really for you. It's your time to come and, and to have your baptism remembered, to, to remember who you are, to remember that you are chosen and marked by God's love because you are the pride of God's life.